rattle through this. Um, I very much here under false pretenses. I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I am a modern historian, I suppose I could call myself. Um, not per me personally as specifically modern, but interested in the modern period, which I take uh, as quite broad brush. So I would contest that th what we see here is a modern landscape as much as also a prehistoric and historic landscape. Um, because it's um, partly, in this particular case, about the apparent absence of people. Um, it, was it a result of clearance? Was it a result of people actually looking to better themselves as the, the economy and society was changing? But it's uh, cut through by cultural routes, um, including the military road, which has been the subject of an excellent project by Perth and Canross Heritage Trust. Um, so what is the time frame that I've been asked to look at? At one time it was 1900 onwards, which would have been nice and easy. Uh, sadly, it's been pushed back a little bit. Um, so what are, should we be talking about historical archaeology? I would say no. Uh, this is an American term that has crept in um, because, uh, for, of course, in America, history started in 1492, um, but not here. So um, I think historical archaeology is anachronism, and I won't use that word again. Um, I think there's a, I have a slight problem with post-medieval, because that is al always looking back to after things, um, after a particular event or a particular way of, of living. Um, and I think people, particularly in the early modern and modern period, were looking forward more than they were looking back. There were antiquarians, but um, the fact that they weren't in the Middle Ages anymore wasn't um, foremost in their minds, I would say. Um, industrial archaeology could be um, a relevant term um, because it's about social archaeology as well as about techno technology. I studied industrial archaeology as my postgraduate degree um, and I spent only a very little time looking at holes in the ground before I realised there was better things to do. Um, and in terms of when the Industrial Revolution started, that was uh, very clearly the 31st of December 1759, when the Karen Ironworks um, was put into operation. Um, so I would argue the Industrial Revolution did happen and it was a sudden dramatic impact. Um, and I don't hold to the, the view, particularly propagated by English revisionist historians, that it took a very long time coming. Um, and I think it did have a dramatic impact um, but um, by the time it got to Perthshire, it was um, a little bit more, um, more it, well, it wasn't having the same sudden impact that it did have, say, in the central belt of Scotland. So, on to um, our engagement with uh, industrial archaeology. Um, there was certainly a, a great deal of uh, resistance to that in certain quarters. Um, in uh, government, um, it has to be said, Stuart Cruden, um, I do not greatly wish to be involved in industrial archaeology because the inspectors are more than sufficiently occupied with things we know about. Um, so basically he was pushing that um, particular topic into long grass as far as possible. But there was pressure, particularly from Strathclyde University um, and uh, also from the Council for British Archaeology, which had employed um, Rex Wales um, to do field work both in England and in Scotland and one of the few photographs I could find that he took in Perth is that one of a, a dynamo in Puller's Dye Works. Um, now coming up to uh, much more recent times we benefit from SCARF um, and that was my starting point when I was quite recently asked to, to look at this particular topic um, and I think um, there are a lot of, um, the, these, this has been written by very clever people, perhaps some of them in the audience, um, and every word is doing a great deal of heavy lifting. Um, and I think it's absolutely excellent and thoughtful, but it doesn't actually tell people what to do, as I think, um, as, as perhaps um, people have been expressing this morning as well, as to if they're faced with a site, what is it, what can be learned from it, should they bo even bother? Um, and it doesn't really tell you that, but it does have a lot of great ideas about reciproc reciprocity between people and place, collaborative modes of inquiry, go beyond recording to questions of social interpretation, so all, all great stuff. Um, and um, I'm not expecting you to read all of that, but uh, there, are, there are 
um, ideas there about working across disciplines, um, taking a historical perspective on landscapes relationships to the present, so that makes it relevant. Um, I think especially the modern period is relevant, but all of you will argue that your own favourite periods are equally relevant, if not more so. Um, so, pressing on. Um, what are the known knowns? I think Donald Rumsfeld has done us all a favour with his uh, known knowns, known unknowns, and then the unknown unknowns. Um, so we can divide up um, our tasks in, on that basis and ask ourselves, what is it that characterise this period in Perth and Kinross? Well, um, Perthshire is clearly both highland and lowland. It's got a city. It's even got some harbours, um, so that there's one. Um, being affected by climate change and um, the waves is, are gradually destroying Kingudi Pier. Um, this is, oop, this is um, a socket for a bollard or capstan, um, which appears to have been wooden. So some of the machinery there um, was um, improvised from wood, and uh, there are also some fo fallen stone um, bollards. So I think there's some work to be done there, um, which is on the north shore of the Tay. Um, and then there's Kinrosha, small county, two towns in it, and a lot of improved and designed landscapes, and a loch which is very much man-made and manicured, um, although with SNH interests around it. Um, so maybe you could, um, in fact, flood the rest of Scotland, and you'd still have a good picture of Scottish archaeology through a good look at Perth and Kinross. Um, I don't really want that to happen, but um, maybe it wouldn't be such such a disaster um, if the rest of Scotland disappeared. Um, now, the known unknowns. Um, I think in, once we're in the modern period, there does tend to be a, a problem that if it survived this long, then it must be commonplace, um, and therefore it doesn't need further study. And indeed, there is a superabundance of records, um, but there are gaps within those records, as I'll try to demonstrate. Um, I sometimes wonder whether archaeologists looking very closely at a site actually um, do have the fully rounded picture that they ought to have of the, the history of that kind of property. Um, I won't go further than that uh, without getting into hot water. And um, how can we make links um, or how can material culture, physical evidence, tell us about things? So, for example, I suggest that this bridge at Hawks of Drimmy um, on the, over the River Eric, north of Blair Gowrie, has particular details under the, the deck there, which are to be found also in other bridges, um, such as uh, one near Balmoral, Crathy Bridge, and um, one in Curtain of Denyla, across the border in Angus, and um, uh, the Linlathan Bridge in Dundee, though a different form, but has the same sort of detail. So I suspect here we've got the hand of John Justice, who um, lived father and son, um, sometime in Perth and sometime in Dundee. Um, so there is physical evidence to be found in early 19th century blacksmithing, for example. Um, I've been asked to suggest 10 modern topics. Um, I've produced a, too few um, handouts for the workshop, but I um, found the, the highfalutin ideas of SCARF actually a little bit difficult to relate to actual the, what do we do with this on the ground. So um, the, maybe it went over my head. So instead, I'm just suggesting some fairly mundane things like the, the division between polite architecture and um, the vernacular. At what stage did one give way to the other? What were the influences behind that? See Daniel Maudlin's book on the Highland House Transformed, for example, discuss. Um, and then perhaps I think it's particularly relevant to look at water power, and I'll come on to reasons for that in a minute. Uh, roads have been covered already um, through the project on military roads, but there are other kinds of roads. There are Drove roads, um, and there are Telford's roads, and there are the, the A9 um, worked on by E. Um, Owen Williams in the 1920s, some remarkable reinforced concrete structures um, to be picked up on the route there as well as um, other archaeological work, I should hope. Um, religious buildings, um, a great many schisms, uh, such as the 1843 disruption. How did that impact on church architecture? You can look at some churches of the 1850s and 60s and say that's a free church and that one isn't. Um, but after a while, that would tend to um, 
telling me my time's up. Right, I shall move on more rapidly. Um, so what kind of building types, um, what, what can look at a building, looking at a building, tell you about when, what went on it, in it? And here we are in Milnathort, and there are a number of these um, basement areas, which I, I think are cellar loom shops for linen weaving. And um, I was looking for these all over Scotland, and Milnathort tends to be the only place that has them which are similar to those that existed in Barnsley, which had a linen industry, and also the cotton weaving um, hand loom shops that would be found in parts of Lancashire. Um, all the other cotton weaving towns and villages tended to have ground floor loom shops, whereas this is very definitely a cellar loom shop. And there are several of these in Milnathorpe. Um, what else is characteristic of Perth and Kinross? Um, I would suggest the circular horse mill um, because um, Perthshire had a slate industry which could produce very small slates. Um, Scots like to be economical in their use of every single little slate, no matter how tiny it got. And therefore, we have uh, the Scots baronial architecture relying on a lot of turrets, and we have horse mills which are circular. If you were in Fife, um, these would be octagonal and would probably have pantiles for better ventilation, but in, in Perthshire, they are that shape. Um, also in Angus, parts of Aberdeenshire. Um, also, what you need to look for are things like truck frames, um, not exclusive to Perthshire, but um, you find these in uh, Camp Cerny, for example, near, near Aberfeldy, and this is in Glenshee. Um, so, uh, vernacular details need to be spotted, um, maybe mapped to see if it's still relevant to uh, their distribution. Um, although there are probably lots of other accidents of history which have enabled some to survive and some not. Um, we've been asked to think about methodological review, and now we're at an age where oral history can come into play, and we can also actual record actual processes in industry, um, as well as the more traditional radiocarbon dating and the like, which probably isn't so necessary in the modern era. Um, Think of a, a good example of a project that tells us what we know about the period. Well, how about um, the identification of clay buildings um, in the Cars of Gowry um, through the Tay Landscape Partnership? Um, so that, that's a very good and recent project. Um, I'm going to suggest maybe looking at water mills because that's something that interests me. Um, there was a, a refurbishment and re um, reactivation of corn mills, um, largely through the activity of John Ridley, um, who's now died, but his, his legacy is here in Blair Athol Mill and in Aberfeldy Mill, even though the Aberfeldy Mill is now a very good bookshop, not a corn mill anymore, but the archaeology is still evident and the machinery is still largely present. But what about all the coals, the tail races, and the, the lades? Um, which maybe could be a, a useful subject for archaeology. Here we are on the Ericht um, in Blair Gowrie. This is an, an unlisted flax mill of the 1830s um, and the owner's house. Um, and we get, there are large water wheels here, and there's also a, a weir, which this is before and after a hydro project actually unfortunately resulted in the breaching of that weir. Um, there is a threat to weirs, and um, this is a, the Dam Removal Europe project, which has succeeded in removing this one. It was only here for 250 years, but it was getting in the way of migratory fish, so it was removed. And this is happening also in Scotland, so watch, watch out for these. Um, and the, there are meetings similar to this one, where the natural heritage people are puzzling over how to persuade the awkward local communities who might want to keep their dam or their weir. Um, so you will come under some pressure from that. Um, now, where were the women? Um, you asked here. Um, these buildings were largely worked by women um, and uh, young people. We're looking from the Bell Mill, the Arkwright Mill, um, which um, was built in Stanley Mills in 1786 to 7, um, looking at buildings that are primarily the 1820s, this one in particular, Mid Mill, um, and this one is a reconstruction, as I'll try to demonstrate. But this area here, the wheel pits, were, was a rockery. Um, so we got JC, JCB out, and uh, Ron Fitzgerald of Halifax did some very good recording there, and that's been published. Not one minute. Um, but um, 
you, you, you will hear this here first, which is that the reopening of Stanley Mills, it was shut between 1814 and 1820, was a result of investment from sugar plantations. Um, Deniston, Buchanan and company, uh, in, in the history books, are described as Glasgow cotton merchants. They were plantation owners and they had partnerships in Jamaica, Grenada, um, Antigua and uh, Buenos Aires. So when people say, oh, slavery, that wasn't the us. I'm afraid it was, um, because not only was the cotton imported from um, slave plantations, it was also largely using money derived from those plantations. But what about all the archival evidence which should demonstrate this? I, I looked up the business records, which are very scanty, and there's just one reference to David Laird, Stanley, Glasgow, Glasgow crossed out Perthshire, so it's been redirected. So it wasn't clear that David Laird was managing these mills, having been a founding partner of Deniston, Buchanan and Company. And um, then, to the surprise and dismay of his partners, he, set, he burnt um, all of the records. Apparently, they, they were consumed by fire, all the records between 1822 and 1825, when the mills were reconstructed, apparently designed. So a deliberate fire has disposed of the archives as a crucial element um, of the history of this site. So we're reduced to looking at the buildings to see what they can tell us about the history of this site. So for example, if you look at this side of East Mill, we clearly have here a slot which carried a trough which carried the water onto a water wheel that was transverse inside the building. And this was excavated um, as part of the um, development of this block um, into flats by the Phoenix Trust, who objected quite a lot to the expense they were being put to, of course. Um, but it was able to um, provide physical evidence um, about the history of this building, which also has flues through a gable. So it is clearly an 18th century mill remodelled in the early 19th century. And you can see this remod remodelling has happened to houses in the village as well, where there isn't harl. You can see the, the blocked windows of um, smaller, lower ceilinged houses compared to the reconstruction of the mid 19th century. And we have uh, graffiti from 1908, 1907, relating people who worked in the mills to King Street Stanley, Store Street Stanley, and so on. So um, that ties us very nicely into the people who are working in the site. Um, then uh, there are, I would suggest, more work to be done in the, particularly the Blair Gowrie area, where uh, th this is an un unlisted complex, um, mainly because the mill itself had a fire, um, but a large water wheel, a diesel engine taken from a submarine, and um, from a, it was a, an allied one from the 1940s sold off when the submarine was scrapped. So two engines, one went to Keith Bank, one to Westfield. And now it's used um, in the um, berry picking industry. So there are sites like these which would repay further investigation, I would suggest. Um, but I'm just uh, uh, scraping at an iceberg. I think that there is an immense amount of work to be done on the modern period, probably not much of it, by taking a spade and a, a shovel out to it, because there's so much of it to see above ground. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to do a gross injustice to um, Gordon Barclay's uh, considerable work and effort he's put into preparing a presentation for today. Um, uh, to uh, provoke your thoughts on military matters relating to the modern period. Um, but uh, I, I think what I'd like to do instead, he does send his apologies, he couldn't be here because of a, a family funeral. Um, but I think what I'd like to, uh, to do is really just, um, I wanted to put the military aspect of the modern period um, kind of onto the map and into our minds. Um, and then we can kind of hopefully unpack this um, more extensively uh, within the workshop um, and, and that, so I'm just going to kind of streamline through this uh, really just to kind of um, highlight some flags and uh, focus on some of his priorities that he's identified here. Um, so uh, I think the key things that uh, Gordon wanted to get across um, was that although Perth and Kinross uh, wasn't necessarily the site of any great military installations uh, from either war, um, with no great naval base or iconic first-line combat aerodromes um, or major army training areas, um, it does have some exceptional features. 
and um, fortunate through accident of preservation, which has uh, has been picked up um, by a number of the champions. Um, but the, the area is home to a spectacularly well-preserved prisoner of war camp in Kilty Bragan, up by Comrie. Um, it's also home uh, to half of the most substantial inland defence uh, of the Second World War in Scotland, and that is the command line, um, and part of another at the northern boundary of Perth and Kinross in the Cowie line. And so the two ma major components there um, that, uh, that, that um, form part of the, the, the modern record. Um, now beyond these physical remains, um, uh, there were also um, um, the major parts um, played by the Polish army uh, that was based here for the first part um, of uh, the Second World War. And that included the HQ for the first Polish army corps at Moncrief House. Um, and, the, and the places where the elite first uh, Polish armoured division were created. Um, the, Nor the Norwegian army um, also had a presence here. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, uh, one of the other things Gordon wanted to bring out was um, uh, the great potential that exists here um, with, within this aspect of the historic environment um, to, um, to to be uh, engaging with um, different communities and that uh, that form part of um, of of the modern Perth and Kinross um, um, wider community and uh, and uh, enabling access into um, into other um, parts of the population that maybe find it harder to engage with our prehistoric heritage, um, for example. Um, now, moving on from that, um, during the Cold War, we also see um, the construction of more structures, including the rebuilding of Second World War Royal Observer Corps posts um, and into radiation proof bunkers. Um, and uh, there's, there were about 13 bunkers, um, but only of, uh, one of which seems to be recorded um, in, the, in the HER. Um, so, some considerable potential in there. Um, now, uh, um, some of the uh, um, so if we if we roll through uh, some of the periods, if we, if we hit on the nineteenth century onwards, um, um, there's you've got this point where militarised society begins to penetrate into the landscape um, with the formation of the drill halls um, as part of the military infrastructure in both the wars. Um, and uh, he's identified a, an interesting challenge here with these and, and uh, sites used as military hospitals where, where you have um, large houses, for example, that, um, uh, that were requisitioned or used for different functions um, in both wars. Um, but um, uh, those linkages um, with, with the wartime roles are, aren't held within HER records and, and listed building records and things. Um, so, trying to reconnect the uh, sort of the military narratives uh, of these building biographies um, is kind of a uh, is, is one of the, the challenges. Um, I also wanted to mention a problem uh, that he sees with the interpretation of this sort of recent historical material. Um, there being a difference between studying and understanding a period, warts and all, and celebrating a, um, a myth mythologized version of it. Um, for example, we might mention the Polish army's political prison at Ochterarder, uh, described rather emotively as a concentration camp in the newspaper accounts at the end of the war. Uh, it's a dark aspect of an otherwise positive presence. Um, but uh, whether we might want to be yeah, considering these um, aspects. Um, yeah, some of the, some of the hospitals, uh, large uh, houses and, and, and properties that um, still occupy, still used um, now. So they're continuing to have um, building biographies, but having these linkages in, in, into, uh, into kind of military functions in both wars. Um, um, yeah, the World War I practice trenches um, being identified through area photography. Um, we have a number of these um, Burnham, Murthy, Confonds in particular. Um, I'm going to jump through these because um, uh, 
mainly because uh, we're, we're running a bit behind. Um, aerodromes and landing grounds. Um, I was just going to draw into the priorities, though. Um, as, uh, as Gordon suggested here, um, that really to, to improve our understanding of this material, um, we mainly have a problem with the quality, completeness and consistency of the local and national historic environment record data sets. Um, and uh, uh, specifically, there's information there that hasn't yet been incorporated into the HERs, and that will have a consequence um, for um, not only for research but also for development control. And I think that's something that um, uh, has has come out from a number of the other champions as well is the need for um, um, kind of maintenance and uh, and cleansing and uh, and keeping our our HER data up. Um, uh, up to speed, so we have um, we have good records that that can then um, in, inform research and and development control. Um, but uh, there's also he also flags up this uh, the point that the structure of the databases means that uh, the use of a place or building uh, for military purposes, for example, temporary use as an auxiliary hospital, um, can rarely be mentioned uh, in the description, or it's not a field. Uh, for, within the indexing. Um, so there's challenges in terms of trying to draw out those parts of the narratives when you're undertaking research. Uh, a particular issue with primary records and the secondary accounts of this period um, is that they can be of variable reliability and even mutually contradictory, or they may not mean quite what they appear to. Uh, thus, relying on one source of information to characterise the use of a place or building can be problematic. And the results of this approach are visible in the databases, uh, where one source has been relied on uncritically. Um, multiple sources need to be cal collated and analysed. Um, beyond these priorities, uh, considerable improvement could be made in basic knowledge and understanding through the examination of documents, many of which are available in Scotland and others which are held in two easily accessible archives in London. This exploration of this aspect of Perthick and Ross's heritage is particularly well suited to wider public involvement, and events may have involved parents or grandparents. Uh, much of it can be done using documents, newspapers, maps and aerial photography. Um, so a, a lot of potential here for um, kind of community-based projects uh, that uh, encourage engagement with the historic environment. Um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to wind up the military at, at that. Um, we can discuss um, Gordon's priorities and, uh, and and gaps a bit more in the, in the workshops. But uh, yeah, for now, um, thanks for thanks for sitting for so long. We have tea and coffee at the back, same drill as before. Um, we'll maybe take um, 10, 15 minutes, grab your tea, and then take it to your workshop with you. Um, um, and we'll try and maximise the amount of time we've got in those. And uh, we'll see you back here after the workshops. Yeah.